Hello and welcome to Quad Trees Part 2. Now before we get stuck in, I have a little bit of an apology to make because in the previous video, Part 1, I claimed that the next video would be up very soon. Well, unfortunately a rather awkward sequence of events occurred in my life just after that video went up. I had to go into hospital. And it turns out I wasn't very well and I had to have my gallbladder removed, so I've spent the last few weeks recovering from that. Anyway, the important part is I am fully recovered, back to normal, so let's crack on with it. Dynamic Quad Trees. I was so convinced that the video was going to be released on time that I even pre-released a little demonstration by announcing it on Twitter, where you could interact with the dynamic quad tree that we're going to build in today's video. This is a little demo of a silly game where you've got to collect the magic bugs, and you can play this in the browser by going to the URL above. I'll put a link in the description too. Uh, the densely populated jungle here is hiding all sorts of bugs, and some bugs are more special than others. In fact, they glow uh, with a little yellow hinge like that. There we go. Look at that. See? And it became quite addictive to try and find the bugs. You can't uh, click on the bugs until you've cleared the foliage that is blocking them from view. There's no real objective to it other than to click on things and to find things, but it's a good demonstration of both the static and dynamic quad trees that we've been looking at in this series. Because the jungle is a very large jungle. See? Lots and lots of trees, and uh, there's a total of 5,000 bugs hidden away in this jungle. All of them are moving around the space. And as in the previous video, we're using quad tree methods to try and work out what is visible on the screen at any one time. But there's a problem with our current implementation. The previous video ended with a demonstration that allowed us to very easily construct a large patch of items floating about in space, and we could extract where those items exist very quickly, uh, in, very quickly indeed, in fact that was the entire point of the video, uh, compared to when we're doing it linearly, which is actually checking if the object is visible, going through all, in this case, one million objects and seeing if it is visible on the screen. The quad tree brought us several orders of magnitude of performance, particularly when we were looking at more sparsely populated areas. You see the difference here, that one's about 30 thousandths of a second compared to, well, 20 milliseconds. In that video, I established the notion of something called a static quad tree, and that's actually a bit of a lie, uh, because we can add things to the quad tree, it can indeed grow, it's not static. However, what we didn't implement was any means of removing things or moving things around in that quad tree data structure. And that's what we're going to have a look at today. It's important to recall that our static quad tree is in fact two different things. On the left, we have the quad tree itself, and on the right, we created a container that used the quad tree to uh, access its elements quickly. And instead of storing the items directly in the quad tree, we stored them in the container, here's our item, and we stored the pointer to the item somewhere in the space of our quad tree. So if it was here, uh, the quad tree would subdivide itself until the region of space at a predetermined resolution is found. And we stored pointers to the items for lots of convenient reasons. Firstly, the pointers are much easier to move about, we're not duplicating and copying the item itself. But also, it meant that we could treat this secondary container like any other container at all. We could actually iterate through it without using the quad tree to access those items. When we specified a search rectangle to the quad tree to determine what items exist within that given space, we would return a container full of the pointers that it found. And of course those pointers point to all of these different things, in this case all of the items that lie within that space. As we add more things to this combination of containers, the quad tree would go and adapt itself and allocate the pointer to the item in the correct location, and the container storing the item itself, well, that would grow in size. If we wanted to remove an item from our container, we don't really know where the item is. The pointer is stored in the quad tree, but it points to the item in this container. Of course, we can easily remove the item from this container, but we also then need to remove the pointer from the quad tree. So let's have a look at a really dumb implementation that allows us to remove a single item from the quad tree. Now I'm continuing with the code exactly as we left it at the end of the last video. At the bottom of the file we had our little demonstration that used the pixel game engine to draw all those rectangles, and at the top of the file we had our two containers, the static quad tree container, which was the drawing on the right, and the static quad tree itself, the spatial acceleration structure. Note that even though at any time we can erase the contents of the tree, we can't actually remove a specific item. We've not created a function to do this. So let's do that. 
And I'm going to stress again that this is a really dumb way to do this, and we'll look at a much better way in a moment. But I think it's necessary to see this part of the journey just to emphasise how bad things can be. Since our quad tree looks and feels like a container, I'm going to add a remove function to it. It's going to return true if it successfully removes the item. And the item passed into it is a type object type. And don't forget that our quad tree was a template, so it could store, well, pretty much anything. The problem I've got to solve is that given the entire tree, I've got to find the location of this item. I don't store that information anywhere. But as we've done with many of the other functions, we can recursively check each quad of the quad tree and check its children to see if it contains the item. And we'll keep doing that until we find the item or we run out of places to search. Each quad tree layer contains a standard vector of a standard pair, which outlines a rectangle and the object itself. Now, at the end of the last video, we did a little clever trick where we were storing the pointers to the items in the quad tree, but that didn't require us to edit the quad tree in any way. And the same applies here. So whether it's pointers or not, it doesn't matter. It's just object type that matters. So I'm first going to check if this layer contains the item. So I need to search through the vector associated with this stage of the quad tree to see if the item exists within it. So I'm going to use the standard find if function. Pass in the beginning and the end to the vector, and I'm not specifically interested in searching for the location. I just want to see if the second part of the pair is the item I am searching for. The find if function returns an iterator. If that iterator is not equal to the end of my vector, well, it found something. Brilliant. Therefore, I can erase the item because I now have an iterator to it in this layer's vector and I'm going to return true. So the user has been informed that an object has been found and removed. If the object wasn't found at this layer, then I've got little choice but to iterate through the four children of this layer, if they exist, and call the remove function on those children. Don't forget, this is a very recursive data structure, so it's calling its own remove function. If a specific child successfully removes the item, then we can propagate that truth all the way back up to the top of the tree and to the user. We don't want to propagate the false because that will stop the search dead in its tracks. It won't check any more of the children. So we know that if we get to this point, we've not found the item that we're trying to remove. So I'm going to return false. So a very quick recap. We're trying to remove an item from this particular stage of a quad tree. We do a search to see if that item exists within the vector contained at this stage in the quad tree. If it does exist, brilliant, then we'll erase it. If it doesn't exist, we'll have to recursively iterate through all of the children, uh, calling the same remove function on those until the item is found and removed or it's not found and nothing happens. In keeping with the methods we've outlined in the first video, we don't typically work on the quad tree alone. We work via the static quad tree container. So we need to expose a remove method in this container too. When we extract items out of the static quad tree container, we're returning a list of quad tree iterators. And don't forget iterators are just posh pointers, that's all. Therefore, it makes sense that any operations we want to do in removing items from this container uh, will pass in that iterator. So I'll prototype a remove function that takes in an iterator to the item we wish to remove. The static quad tree container maintains all of the items it's storing in a list of the object type. The quad tree itself stores pointers to the location of the item in that list. So we can call on our quad tree our remove function and directly pass in the iterator. Hopefully that will remove it from the quad tree. The nice part about having a container with just a list of the objects is this iterator we're passing in happens to be an iterator to some location in that list. So the items contained within the static quad tree, in this case, all of the items, we can simply call the arrays function using the iterator we pass in. And so that's all we need to do for our static quad tree container object. I'm now going to add some code that will allow us to remove some of the rectangles from our demonstration application. I'm going to add a variable called f search size which is going to be the area underneath my mouse cursor in the world. And it's that area of objects that we're going to delete from the world. And in on user update, I'm just going to allow me to change the size of that variable very crudely by scrolling the mouse wheel or pressing the Q and A buttons. I want to make sure that this uh, variable doesn't go out of control, so I'm clamping it to a range. Our world is using a transformed view, which allows us to have a much bigger world than we can see on the screen. I want to know where my mouse is in that world, so I'm going to create a V mouse vector, pass in the screen's mouse position, and use the transform view object to transform that screen position into world space. 
My search size variable is the length of a single side of a rectangle I wish to search. So I'm going to create a uh, actual vector of that search size, width and height. And then we can use the OLC rectangle type that we created as part of the static quad tree video to give me a rectangle in the world space surrounding that mouse coordinate. Below the code where we're handling the quad trees, I'm going to draw that region. Let's just take a quick look to see if this works. So here we can see a region underneath my mouse cursor. I can change the size of it with the Q and A keys. And it exists within the world of rectangles. So what I'll add now is that when we press the backspace key, we'll delete the rectangles that are highlighted by that area. The original program here has code for when we're not using the quad tree. I'm no longer interested in this. We're only going to be using quad trees now. The original code has a for loop that iterates through all of the returned results where we searched our tree of objects for what was visible on the screen. In a very similar way, I'm going to search the entire tree for the objects that exist within our search area. So I'll search our tree of objects passing in the rectangle M and the results will go into variable R. And if I'm holding down the backspace key, I want to iterate through all of the objects returned in R and remove them from our tree. I think syntactically that works out very nice. Let's take a look. So here is our background and if I hold down the backspace key, perfect, we can see that rectangles overlapping with our search rectangle get erased. Make it a bit bigger. We can also see that the total number of objects being drawn on the quad tree is diminishing. It's looking pretty good. Zoom out a bit. That's looking okay. I'm right now down in the bottom right hand side of our tree and I've observed something a bit of a problem. If I press backspace now, there's a noticeable delay. You can see the application actually freezes for a good second or so. And look at the lag and the latency whilst trying to move this around. Suddenly, all of the gains of our quad tree, well, they've, they've disappeared almost. And it gets worse the further to the bottom right I go. Back up in the top left, we can see it's almost instant. Hmm. Well, I'm hoping that for some of you, it's fairly obvious why this method sucks. We're performing a search of the entire quad tree to find a specific item that we've passed into it. Our quad tree has always operated on the principle of the children being in this order, one, two, three, and four. So this region gets searched. And if it doesn't find anything, it's got to subdivide and check its children, which has to subdivide and check its children and so forth. It's going to recursively do this until it exhausts the number of branches in the quad tree. At which point it unravels itself and goes and checks the next one. We're conducting lots and lots of searches which are bought quickly if they're up here in the top left. We've no, if we find the item, uh, we can just abandon the rest of the search. But if we're down here in the bottom right, we've had to do all of the searches for all of the children and all of the space uh, everywhere to the top left of the object's actual location. This is less than ideal, thus dumb. From the perspective of the container, it works the item is removed from both the quad tree and the static quad tree container. But in terms of usability, it's useless. So we need to do something better. And if you're expecting some magical formula and algorithms, well, you're going to be disappointed. I'm going to solve this literally by throwing memory at it. I'm going to add some additional bookkeeping, which will allow us to keep track of where the objects are in space and where they are in our container. This way, when I search for a particular object, I know where it is in the tree and I know where it is in my container and I can remove both at the same time. It's important to be realistic about this. Don't forget, we're only storing pointers to things. So the things that are actually stored in our quad tree are very small. So I think we can afford a little bit more RAM uh, to store some information to help us out and make our quad tree dynamic. In our current static quad tree implementation, each quad contains a vector of items. And it just so happens that those items happen to be the pointers to the items in this container here. 
Vector was chosen because it was the fastest, and it made the assumption that we weren't going to be dynamically altering the quad tree very much. If we're going to be routinely moving things around the quad tree, we don't want to be resizing vectors every single time. Well, we might. The truth is, this is the type of thing you need to benchmark. But for today's video, I'm going to replace the vector with a list. And the reason I'm choosing a list is because if I do make any alterations to what the list contains, the objects already in that list don't move around in memory, and thus the iterators, the pointers, they remain valid. As mentioned several times, that list would contain a pointer to the location of the item in this container. But I'm going to augment the data type that's stored within this container. I'm going to extend it to add some additional properties. When we store the item in the container, we take its location and we go and store that in the quad tree using the insert method. The insert method doesn't currently return anything, but I'm going to modify that insert function to return a pointer to this list and the position, the iterator, of the item in that list. So we get a pointer to the list itself at that particular quad and an iterator to the item within that list. Now, when I search for a specific item in this container, I know immediately which container in the quad tree is storing its location and where to find it. I don't need to do any searches. And this additional information has very minimal memory overhead. At least, it's within what I'm prepared to accept. I've now added a degree of bidirectionality to my uh, container and my quad tree. That change of container from vector to list or whatever you think is relevant for your implementation, and you'll need to make some intelligent decisions about what suits your needs in that regard, means I'm not just going to directly modify my static quad tree anymore. I'm going to keep it as it is, uh, but I'm going to cut and paste the whole thing uh, and then rename it dynamic quad tree. As I've already mentioned, I'm going to be using standard lists now for all of my containers within the quad tree and the quad tree container. In the previous video, there was a bit more flexibility about what container type would be most sensible, and that may well still apply here. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comments below. I now have this somewhat awkward combination of pointers and iterators as part of my container. And don't forget, this is all template magic as well. So to stop things getting out of control, I'm going to create an intermediate structure which represents this entry in our container database. And I'm going to call it a quad tree item location. Now, this is where things get a little bit wordy. Firstly, I'm going to store the address of the container wherever it exists in our quad tree. I know the container is going to be a list this time round. And that list contains pairs of rectangles and the object we're storing. And I only want the address of this container. The container itself, well, it contains items, but which specific item do I mean? Well, I can access that information by having a second parameter in my structure that represents the iterator. This structure is really just a way to stop this becoming template hell when we're debugging it all later. In our current static quad tree, our insert function is void. Instead, I want it to populate our structure and return it. I'm not making any change to how the insert function functions, but just its return type. If none of the children accepted the item, then the item needs to be inserted into this particular layer, and that's where we'll populate this structure. It didn't fit, so the item must belong to this quad. And I'm going to use a little bit of initialization magic to make this a bit more bearable. I can simply return the address of the container at this layer of the quad tree and an iterator to the most recently added item pushed to the back of that container. I know I often take the mickey out of the standard library, but when it starts coming together like this, it does make it all worthwhile. There's a lot going on in those two lines of code, yet there's nothing going on that isn't fully understandable. This is why I love C++. It has this fantastic ability to really allow me to express the things that I want. And yes, occasionally it bites back. More often than not, I get the job done. So with these minimal changes to our insert function, we should now go and modify the insert function in our dynamic quad tree container object. Right now, the quad tree container object is just a standard list of our object directly. However, now it's a list of a combination of the item itself and this additional location information in our tree. So again, I'm going to create a temporary little structure to help us manage that sensibly. I'll create a structure called a quad tree item. 
Now, this will change the syntax of how we interact with our tree from the user's perspective ever so slightly, as it effectively adds a layer of indirection, and we'll see the changes we need to make due to that shortly. So our quad tree item firstly contains the item itself. This is passed in as a template, that is the item. And this is where things are going to get a little bit head scratching. Uh, we're going to add in that quad tree item location object. But the type that we're passing in, don't forget, is the address of the item in a list. Our quad tree stores pointers to the items in this list. The thing is, they're no longer the items, they are this intermediate object. And this is where we can see we've now added a layer of indirection because the list in our quad tree container is now a list of these quad tree item types and an individual quad tree item type contains the item itself, as well as the location of where it's stored in the quad tree. The only thing we need to change now about the dynamic quad tree container is its insert function. Here it is. Previously, we just stored the item directly. That's no longer an option for us. Instead, we need to create a new instance of our quad tree item struct. And the item we're inserting, I can set straight away. The container of all the items will now be given this new item. We modified our quad tree component to return the location of the item represented by the container the item is stored in and its location within that container. Since we know the item at the back of our all item list is the newest item we've just added, I can set the pointer to that item directly. So now when we want to remove an item from all of this, we can remove the item just as we did before. But we also now have the information to remove it from the quad tree without needing to search for it. In fact, we don't need the quad tree's remove function at all. And we can replace that with the following. The item that's coming in contains a pointer to the item stored in the quad tree. It's stored in a container somewhere, which we now have access to. So we can call the erase function on that container and then pass in the location of the item within that container because we've also got that iterator information as well. So let's see what happens when we change in our example program the static quad tree container to our dynamic quad tree container. Well, firstly, we get an error now flagged with our search results. And that's because our dynamic quad tree isn't returning the items directly, it's returning these quad tree item structures. So we get the item and the location of the item within the structure. There is probably some fantastic C++ syntactic sugar we can apply to this to make that go away. However, I quite like the verbosity here, that it isn't the same as it was before. I don't need to alter anything about how we're removing the objects now. So let's take a look. Populated the trees, and I'm right in the top left at the moment. I'll just make this as big as possible. Right in the top left, and if I press backspace, it removes the items, just as it did before. Very good. Uh, let's move now all the way to the bottom right. So I'm going to follow this top edge and we'll follow this one down. Now previously there was a latency when we tried to delete something. So I'll press the delete key. Ah, perfect, very good. In fact, I can paint backspace just like I can in the top left. There is no difference now because we don't need to perform any searches. We just know precisely where things are to be erased. Since we now know we can remove things very quickly and we can search for things very quickly, we can turn this into a proper dynamic tree by allowing objects to move around in it. And it really is as simple as it sounds. We simply remove the object and reinsert it. I'm going to add to my dynamic quad tree container a new method called relocate, which takes in an iterator to the item we wish to change the position of and a new location. Bear in mind that the rectangle is a position and a size of that object, so we can also scale the object too. We don't need to remove the item from this container's list of all of the items, but we do need to remove it from the quad tree. So I'm going to copy that line directly. And because we've not removed the item, we're just relocating it, I'm going to update the pointer of that item with the new information of where it is in our quad tree. So here I remove the item from the quad tree and I reinsert it and store that new location. Right, let's crack on and build that demo application I showed at the start. It's actually very simple, now we have all of the tools at our disposal. I'll briefly outline what it is that I'm building. Uh, we're going to have an arena, which is going to be quite large. And inside that arena, we're going to populate it with all sorts of bushes of different sizes and shapes and positions, and different images as well. If you've got a good graphics pack to hand, uh, you might as well uh, use lots of different types of bushes, so they all look differently. 
and even though it's not very clear here, these can all be very different scales too. Bushes of course don't move. Nestled in amongst the bushes, I'm going to have some critters. I'm going to have a lot of critters, and the critters are going to just walk linearly around this arena, and when they hit an edge, they're going to bounce off it, like that classic DVD bouncing logo thing. Insert various memes here. A proportion of these critters are going to be special critters. They're special that they just look slightly different. They don't behave differently, but it gives the player something different to do. Using the remove functions we've just seen, I'm going to allow the user to cut down bushes. And as they cut down bushes, they reveal the critters, and they also reveal a tiled terrain in the background. So the terrain's going to be a very large image, and I'm just going to tile it across the transformed view. This has nothing to do with quad trees, it's just aesthetically pleasing. The user will collect a bug by clicking on them but they can only click on them if there isn't a bush in the way. So there's two tasks. You first of all have to erase the bushes and then you have to click on the book. And this sounds incredibly tedious and to some degree it is. It took me about an hour to find all 500 gold bugs, uh, but it was like a massive jigsaw puzzle stroke, where's Wally stroke, where's Waldo, depending on where you're from. And I found that once I'd started, I just couldn't stop until I'd found them all. And what's good, interesting is as you remove the foliage, you really lose your bearings of where you are in the world. So you have to do it in such a way where you employ a strategy and don't get lost. Just to put some numbers to this, in total we're going to have 5,000 bugs, like an average one loan coder program I suppose. 500 of those are going to be special bugs, I've called them treasure bugs. And I'm going to have 100,000 bushes. Now I will be going through the code pretty quickly because a lot of it is just sort of setup information and loading graphics, which is uninteresting stuff. But you'll actually see the game itself is implemented in very few lines of code. I have this nasty habit of creating everything in one file, it just makes the video making a much simpler process. So I'm going to create a new uh, Pixel Game Engine subclass here for our game. And I'm going to call it Jungle Explorer. And as always it has an onUserCreate function and an onUserUpdate function. And I'm going to change our main function to not run the static quad tree example demo we've just overwritten, uh, but to run this new game jungle explorer thing instead. Firstly, I'm going to add a structure that represents a bush object. It contains a position of where it is in the world, a unit size, which we'll look at in a minute, a variable scale for how big this bush is going to be in the world, and an integer that represents which image out of a set of images is going to be representing that bush. And I'm going to use my new dynamic quad tree container to represent those bushes. I've got a variety of bushes to choose from, so I'm going to store the graphics as OLC renderables in this standard vector. This is just a convenience class that stores the sprite and the decal. I'm going to add some convenience variables uh, to store the size of the arena, it's 10,000 by 10,000, and later on we'll need the size of the screen too. And as we've done with all of these demos so far, I'm going to need a transformed view object to allow me to pan and zoom. In on user create, just as we did before, I'm going to initialize my transform view object with the dimensions of the screen. Now in the first video I forgot to do this and it was very embarrassing, uh, I'm going to resize the, the quad tree that contains all of these bushes to the size of the arena. I'm now going to populate my vector full of bush graphics. I have 10 or so different graphics for bushes, uh, and they're all different sizes. So I'm just going to create an empty slot in my vector of renderables, and then load it. This is all Pixel Game Engine specific stuff, uh, but if you're interested, I'm not loading it from a resource pack, uh, but I do want the images to be filtered. They're not going to look pixelated. Because I don't like standard random, I'm going to create a quick hack random float function, and I'm going to add 100,000 bushes to the bush quad tree. So here's the 100,000, I'm going to sit in a loop, create a bush object, choose a random graphic that represents that out of my vector of bush graphics, uh, then use my floating point random function to randomly position it somewhere within the arena. I'm going to randomly scale it so I can use the same graphic but it looks different at different scales. Uh, and then I'm going to cache this unit size uh, variable. This allows me to draw it sensibly later on because the graphics are slightly different sizes. They're not all a consistent resolution, these images. Uh, I need to be able to factor that in when I'm drawing it and it just it's really just this cache that takes the uh, reciprocal of the size of the sprite so it saves me having to do that divide later on. Don't forget we're going to be drawing many many things here so little optimizations like this can actually uh, yield very good results. And then I'm going to take this structure that I've just created and insert it into my quad tree of bushes. There it is and I'm going to search it at the right position and it's of the scale that we've chosen and calculated. Done. Told you this one will be quickly. That's all of the bushes added. So let's get those drawn on the screen. I'm going to tell the transform view to handle the pan and zoom. 
And then I'm going to populate a rectangle structure with the dimensions of the screen in world space. When we search our quad tree, it's not looking for items that are entirely contained within that rectangle, it's looking for items that in any way touch or overlap that rectangle. So I can draw all of my bushes in an almost one liner by doing the search in my quad tree of bushes of that screen rectangle and then using the draw decal function to draw that item uh, within the transform view space. So you can see I take the bushes index here into my vector of graphics to display and I can scale it sensibly. Right, so with these three functional lines, let's see what we've got. Well, I see a black background uh, with lots of bushes and I can zoom in and out. And you see they're nicely filtered, they don't look pixelated. The frame rate is very good uh, and it's a very large arena of bushes too, look at that. Lots of them. Bushes, done. We know we want to be able to chop bushes down. I'm going to do that when the player holds down the spacebar. This is exactly the same as erasing objects that we just showed earlier in this video. I'm going to call it chopping in this case, and I'm exactly the same. I'm going to create an area under the mouse cursor in world space. And if the user is holding down the spacebar, I'm going to be chopping things down. So I'm going to use auto here uh, to create a list of all of the pointers within the rectangle of our chopping area, and then simply remove them from our quad tree. If I'm not holding down space, uh, then I'm going to be panning and zooming. As before, it's useful to be able to see uh, where we're chopping things down. So if we are chopping, I've set this flag to true, I'm just going to draw a slightly shaded rectangle over the area after we've drawn the trees. So let's take a look now. So if we hold down the spacebar, I've got a lightly shaded rectangle and it chops down the trees underneath. You can't scale the rectangle in this case. Uh, because I think that would ruin the game if you could cut back huge swathes of uh, rainforest all in one go. That's not a good message to send out, is it? Uh, you may notice something, a little sort of aesthetic twist to things, and these are the type of things that keep you up at night. Uh, is the rectangle isn't actually erasing everything that it touches. Uh, this is actually a deliberate choice. And you can see that I'm drawing that rectangle larger than the actual size it is removing the bushes from. If I just temporarily set it back to the actual chopping size, uh, you tell me what you think looks and feels better. Because the tree graphics aren't necessarily drawn right up to the boundaries of the image, it's possible to remove bushes that you don't actually touch. See? We got it in the corner there. I think that's not very pleasing to the eye. Whereas displaying the chop area is slightly bigger, is. Much nicer. I think so anyway. It's no good just chopping bushes back to see the empty void of space, I'd rather see some ground behind them instead. And I'm going to abuse some pixel game engine things here, I'm going to create a tiled transformed view so I can very easily just draw some graphics repeatedly in the background. And I'll store the background image in another renderable. I know that that image happens to be 1024 by 1024 pixels, so I'm going to create a tile transform view where one whole image at full resolution represents one tile within the view space. And I'm going to load the graphic for the ground. In on user update, once I've got the screen position, uh, I can work out in tile space what the top left tile and the bottom right tile are using the tile transform view. Knowing this, I can simply tile my image across the screen. Let's take a look. So we can see behind the bushes already, there is a graphic, ah, but it doesn't move with the bushes. This is because we've got two transform views layered on top of each other. But we're only handling the pan and zoom in one of them. Let's do it to both and try again. There we are. Now they move together. If I zoom out and not uh, over the bushes, you can see there's some repetition to the texture, uh, but it is designed to be somewhat seamless. It's always very difficult to get seamless textures uh, that are large, that work well and look very seamless. At a certain scale, you always start to notice. Good, so that's ground and bush is done. Now it's time to add the bugs. Now it just so happens that I have a nice little library of bugs that contain two sprites of animation, and I've got them side by side. So a single image contains both uh, state A and state B of a particular animation. And I've got 30 different bugs. I'm going to create a bug structure, which just like the bushes contains a position, a size, but because the bugs are going to move around, they also have a velocity. I'm also including a flag that indicates it is one of these special bugs, and just as with the bushes, which image in a vector of images is going to represent that bug. 
I'm going to store all of the bugs in the game in a dynamic quad tree container. There's a surprise. And I'm going to call it tree bugs. I'll have a vector of renderables for my bugs. I want the bugs to look pixelated, so I'm not going to filter them. But in on user create, I'm going to load the graphics. Now, before I had all sorts of different file names for the trees and the numbering system was, uh, was strange. Uh, this time the bugs are all called monster followed by number. So I'm doing this algorithmically in a for loop. That's loaded the graphics, but it's not populated the quad tree with bugs. Instead, we're going to do that in this loop. The game needs to keep track of how many bugs are left. I could use the size of the container, uh, or I could just store the variables locally. The total number of bugs, the total number of treasure bugs, and how many of these have been found. So as I go through each bug, I allocate it an image, I give it a position in the arena, I give it a size. Again, they're slightly scale different, so the same bug graphic can be used, but it's shown at different scales. And then I need to give it a velocity. So I choose a random angle and a random speed and set a velocity vector accordingly. I can also set the flag of whether it's a treasure bug or not, and then I insert it into my dynamic quad tree. Our drawing order becomes important here. We have the ground, then we have the bugs, but the bushes occlude the bugs. Drawing the bugs is simply a case of again searching our tree for the visible screen area, and then drawing the bug using the right graphic. Now, I have some additional information here for the treasure bugs, because I want them to sort of pulse yellow, so they look golden. I also have these two different images per bug, and I want it to oscillate between the two. These both require timekeeping stuff. Since there's only two frames for every single bug, I'm just going to use a boolean. It's displaying one or the other. In on user update, before we do anything else, that's where I like to do things with time. Uh, I'm going to accumulate the current time, and if it's greater than half a second, uh, I flip the state of that boolean variable. I could randomize this and do it per bug, so they all look like they're twitching at different times, uh, but this is going to give a fairly retro aesthetic where all of the bugs change on screen from one sprite to the other. So this boolean flag is used to determine where the source image comes from in that single sprite. If the bug is a treasure bug, I want it to pulse yellow. Now the Pixel Game Engine has routines to handle the drawing of a pulsed yellow graphic. We can change the tint of the decal when we draw it. We just need to change the frequency of that yellow colouring. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm biasing a sine wave between 0 and 1, and then using that 0 and 1 to set the red and green components of a colour, which form yellow, so it'll, it'll go from black to yellow as a pulse. So that's our bugs, let's have a look. So if I erase some of the bushes, we can see the bugs are all happily dancing from one sprite to the next. They're different scales too. So here we can see this is clearly the same bug as this one, but it's drawn at a different pixel scale. These treasure bugs are pulsating between black and a golden yellow type colour. And they're all happily dancing in synchrony. Lovely. Oh, and let's not forget, there's many of them. We need the bugs to move around. Now, we could do it uh, by checking which bugs are visible on the screen and just updating those. Uh, there's 5,000 of them after all. Perhaps updating them is too time consuming per frame. The only trouble with this is if you set a region for a certain set of bugs to be updated, as you start playing the game, you can very visibly pick up on where this region is because bugs that are static suddenly all start moving at once. It's not very nice to look at. An alternative approach is that per frame, given the bugs are moving slowly, you update all the even bugs, then all the odd bugs, and then all the even bugs, uh, and you just update their positions every other frame. This is quite a common strategy in games where you've got lots of moving entities. The third strategy and the one lone coder approach is to just brute force it. There's only 5,000 things to update, that's not a big deal today. Fortunately, our quad tree container, don't forget, just has a list of all the bugs. We can actually go through it very quickly indeed and update things. We don't need to include the quad tree at all. Firstly, I'm only going to update the bugs if the window has focus. Now, this is not something you see very often on the Pixel Game Engine, uh, but as we're starting to do things in the browser as well, using the Inscript and backend, uh, it has become noticeable that if you click away to another tab, things are still updating. And then when you click back, there seems to be some sort of latency. I don't know. It's some sort of web dev mystery with how JavaScript works. Anyway, this makes it go away. And to be a little bit different, rather than using a little auto for loop, I'm going to manually construct a loop that just iterates through all of the bug objects within the quad tree containers list. Now to stop these being a little unwieldy, and you can see I'm using auto all over the place, it's a tremendously dirty habit I've picked up. This iterator 
points to our combined item and its location in the quad. I don't care about the location really, uh, all I care about is the item itself. So uh, just to make the syntax a little bit more readable, uh, I'm creating this uh, reference here to the item. And then we've got standard one loan coder stuff here, we've done this countless times in other videos. We're going to update the position of the bug by modulating its velocity with f elapsed time. To keep it within the boundaries of the arena, I'm actually going to check that the bug hasn't left the arena. If it has, I'm going to flip the velocity into the opposite direction depending on which boundary it's hit. And I'm also going to make sure that it is reset to that boundary location. So the bugs aren't starting to wander outside of the arena. And that does it first for the x-axis, and then I do exactly the same for the y-axis. So the bug has now changed position. This is a perfect opportunity for us to call our relocate function. So on the tree of bugs, I call the relocate function, I pass in the iterator, which bug am I relocating, and I pass in a, an initializer which sets up a new location and size for that bug within the arena. There's a little bit of information duplication there, how you choose to use this positional information is entirely up to you. So that's it, super simple bug updating with collision detection. Let's take a look. If I clear some of the bushes, we can see the bugs are very slowly moving around. Let's go and have a look at some of the edges. Well, we can see that one just bounced off. Let's try and find some others that are going towards the edges. Remember, they move very slowly. Oh, there we go. It's going up. And bounces off. Nice. And finally, we get around to adding the actual gameplay element. Picking up the bugs that you're interested in. Now, to stop the user using the cursor like a paintbrush, I'm only going to respond to the mouse button being released, so you have to individually click on each bug. But I am going to use the quad tree to help me out here. I'm going to create a very small rectangle, which effectively represents the mouse click in world space. Recall that we've already calculated where the mouse is in the world. Now, I don't want to be able to pick up bugs that are behind bushes. So this very small rectangle I'm going to use to search my tree of bushes to see if anything's there. If there are any bushes at that location, the returned container won't be empty. If it is empty, then I know that the bushes have already been cut down, which means I can now use the same search rectangle again in my quad tree of bugs to see which bug is under my mouse cursor at that location. It could very well be the case there are multiple bugs. I don't take that into account. So whatever bugs are under the mouse cursor where there isn't a bush, I'm going to iterate through that container of them. If they're a treasure bug, I'm going to increment the number of treasure bugs found, and I'm going to remove the bug from the quad tree of bugs. All that is left now to add is some statistics telling the user how well they're doing. And this is just going to be some text on the screen. Let's take a final look. Got our text, it's got the name of it, it's got some scoring, it's got some instructions. If we hold down the space bar, we can start to erase some of the bushes. And if I click on a treasure bug, well, the total number of bugs has gone up by one, but the special bugs has also gone up by one. If I click where there isn't a bug, well, there's nothing going on. Let's collect a non-treasure bug. Good, the scores have increased accurately. Uh, we shouldn't be able to click on bugs that are behind bushes. See, this one here, oh, well, there's a bush in front of it. Well, until it got out of the way of the bushes. So that means our bush collision detection algorithm is working just nicely too. And um, we're going to have a look over here. And down bottom right, always check the bottom right as well. Good, everything seems to be functioning just as normal. You can go and play this in the browser uh, from the link below. And you can see our frame rate is, is actually quite pleasing too. That's good. And maybe it would add a cap to how far you can zoom out. Uh, but it's okay, I'm pleased with that. And so there you have it. By making some very slight changes to the static quad tree we created in part one, we've now got a dynamic quad tree which can handle the moving of objects within the space bounded by the quad tree. We're doing this by adding a little bit of additional bookkeeping, which is not an uncommon way to achieve quite significant optimizations in all sorts of problems. Again, let me offer my apologies for this video being so late. Yes, I'm full of a cold. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. Come and have a chat on the Discord server, and I'll see you next time, I promise. Take care.